real challenge that have all this going on, acquisitions, Indian, Indian uh, participation in this, in two Indian companies, at least two Indian companies, uh, actively producing these technologies, uh, and uh, no oversight of any kind, no regulatory framework, evidence of uh, misuse. Uh, because they, they always claim they do it for lawful purposes, but there's absolutely no way of uh, verifying it. Uh, so, uh, 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 a Congress member, a member of the ruling party has introduced a private member's bill, and it looks like nobody in the government or in his ruling party, in the ruling party of the Congress, is taking any notice of it. Uh, we are in a, we have touch with this uh, MP, and uh, you know, it's a work in progress. We are very concerned, and uh, you know, earlier people thought this was a concern mainly to Western countries where there's a great deal of concern over privacy and the violation of privacy, but I think it's equally an issue in India. And let's just quickly think of that, how happy we are to be in this partnership uh, which WikiLeaks has made possible. This is our third project with WikiLeaks. Maybe there's no time to, to describe the earlier ones, but for us it's been a very valuable experience. Initially it looked completely one-sided, WikiLeaks we were the recipients, although we did the stories. Uh, but now I think this is a new kind of partnership that is being forged where Julian, uh, I've spoken to Julian on this. Uh, you have to be a generous sharer. You do your research, you share your research and insights. And uh, uh, when you do your own stories, it depends what could be better in journalism of this kind than uh, this uh, experiment. We learn from it, and I think I may look forward to what looks uh, new and exciting. So, thank you very much, Mickey Lakes, for partnering with us and giving us an opportunity to partner with all the others uh, in this international consortium, uh, which uh, takes up an extremely important issue of great international significance and uh, real significance in India as well. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much. I think to continue, if we may, the, the discussion about emesis, which we discussed briefly a few minutes ago, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mark Manan to discuss a bit of that. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Thomas Manan, I'm a French journalist and working uh, at Audi, and I've been, uh, I've been investigating this analysis stuff uh, since uh, this, uh, this summer. In fact, we discovered that in June, that Amazis, a French company, sold a massive internet, that's their word, massive internet interception system at the scale of a nation to Gaddafi in Libya in 2006. Uh, it's forbidden to use it in France, it's forbidden to buy it in France, but have the right to sell it in Libya because there's no rule in France, there's no rule in Europe, there's no rule all over the world to prevent. Uh, company in a democratic country to sell those kind of surveillance technologies to uh, dictatorships. So what I've discovered is that the first sell a cryptographic software to protect the Kadafi's communication from the Echelon spying system. <coughs> then they sold it, they sold to Kadafi a network stream analyzer and a cell system to uh, spy on everything that goes on and out, out of Libya through the internet. And, uh, and then I discovered the manual, the operator manual of the, the, the system. And in the manual, it's written that it, you can, be, uh, it can spy on email, it, uh, it's, it's able to spy on what you look on the web, what you type on Google, uh, what you type on the chat, everything that goes and, uh, on the internet, that you receive on the internet, can be spied uh, by the system. And on the manual, it explains that you can graph the relationships of a certain person. And then I go there to show you this graph because it, it's important.
Emmanuel. 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 And this like how it works, that you can spy on email, Gmail, MSN chat, Yahoo chat, etc. And after all the examples are redacted, I will show you the page which, which is important. On page 50, uh, 52, you've got, you got a picture which is redacted. Just click on the image, the big image. Just, uh, hang on, hang on a second. So I just, because this is a critical moment. Yeah. So, yeah. so <laughs> this company, Amasis, is a, one of the big spying companies in France, a bit like Siemens uh, in Germany. So this Amasis system was installed in Libya uh, at least by 2009. And this manual uh, that uh, Ogni obtained as part of this research effort includes uh, how to run that system and what its capabilities are. As some of you might be aware that with PDFs, sometimes if information is redacted from a PDF, you can uncover it using uh, a cut and paste technique. And so this manual, uh, John Luke was uh, clever enough to see exactly what had been redacted. This was not a publicly released manual even. Uh, this was a manual that appears to have been produced for Gaddafi, uh, perhaps in order to sell it uh, to him. And it contains extra key information which he will explain. So, you copy the image, the image, then you paste it, and then it's unredacted. And you see the second name, Jeffrey Smell, he's a lawyer. He's the lawyer of the Bureau of the Investigative Journalism. By extraordinary coincidence, we discovered that one of the targets in this manual, the Amnesty Spying Manual from Libya, just happened to be the Bureau's lawyer. Anakoa, this shows the users of Eagle wanted to know who is Anakoa and who, is, who knows Anakoa. Let me introduce you, Anakoa. So, this manual has been written in the beginning of 2009, at the time when nobody knew the Libyan opposition. Anakoa is Mahmoud al Naku, who is the actual Libyan ambassador in London. He lives for the last 30 year, 32 years in London. You've got also Achalo Ghali. Achalo Ghali is the one of the 13 founding members of the National Transition Council in Libya, who has been created in February to help Libyans liberate themselves. He is the actual uh, minister, culture minister in Libya. He is in the Green League. You've got also Ali Abu who lives in Washington for the last 30 years. And Ashur al Shamis, who is a Libyan journalist living in London for 20 years. There were Ashur al Shamis and Ali Abu Zakouk were financed by the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a, a NGO, US NGO, financed by the U American Congress. They gave them uh, money for the last four years to help democracy spread in Libya. So, in the green list, you also got 2% from the National Endowment from Democracy, 33, 34. So, what I've discovered is that the Amazon system has been used not only to spy on Libyans living inside Libya, but also to spy on Libyans living in London, in the United Kingdom, and in the United States, and to spy on a British lawyer, and to spy on two people uh, financed by the US Congress. For, I think there are uh, 15 Libyans in this green list. Ten were living, uh, six were living in, the, in England, uh, two were living in the United States, and for the five people that are living in Libya, three has been threatened, by the Libyan authorities in 2009 because of the use of the internet. Moussa Kousa, who is the chief, was the chief of the uh, secret services in Libya, personally threatened one of the <coughs> Libyans and showed him, you know, this is the list of uh, all the people you are in contact with, stop it, now. Wow, that's it. That's what, how they use this system. Uh, and important clarification is that these are not individual uh, 
our targets who have individually been spied upon. The Amazon system is a bulk interception system. It sucks out everything, and these people's details are in the, in the maps. I think, I think thanks very much. I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Our, our next uh, speaker will be Jacob Applebaum, uh, who's a research scientist at the University of Washington and has been long associated with uh, issues of independent computer security. Uh, Julie wanted to have a word about him first. Well, I have to say how much it pleases me to see Jake here today because Jake once filled in for me at a conference in New York about a year and a half ago. And ever since that point in time, uh, he has been detained on what, nine, eight, eight tenths of the flights that he has made in and out of the United States. So um, I hope, I hope uh, Jake, this doesn't cause you any more grief, or perhaps everyone else on this panel will share the grief. Thanks, Jake. So what I wanted to talk about today is basically summed up in three words, reject lawful interception. It can be said just as simply as that. Whenever someone says that they wish to be able to have so-called lawful interception, you should hear that as, I wish the right to be able to spy on you in a way that is completely unaccountable, that is not transparent, and you should trust us to never abuse this. This is something that we must reject, and these, these systems that are revealed in these documents show exactly the kind of systems that the Stasi wish that they could build. If you remember from the history books, the Stasi letter opening machines. The Stasi letter opening machines were the deep packet inspection <coughs> machines of the mail service. And this document cache and these surveillance systems are specifically de designed to be essentially what you would need if you wanted to have a general warrant, which is generally something that we consider to be a form of tyranny. And these systems have been sold by Western companies largely to places, for example, like Syria and Libya, and Tunisia, and Egypt. These systems are used to hunt people down and to murder them. There's no question that these systems are used just as weapons are used. And these systems are sold not as you would sell a Nissan truck, but rather they are sold with support contracts. They are sold with training. They are sold in order to ensure ongoing service, including software updates, and including individual targeting. This is something that is not actually so different, and in history we have seen this. Edwin Black wrote a book, and it's a fantastic book I really recommend that everyone reads. It's called IBM and the Holocaust. And this is something that was done by Watson at IBM. Individually, knowing about the cases, understanding that he was helping with the genocide for the purposes of profiting from it. We've dealt with this in human history before, and we need to deal with it again. There are people every day that are being murdered based on the intelligence that is gathered by these devices. And make no doubt about it, this kind of spying impacts people not just in the Middle East, but also in the West. As you see, people with relations there. But additionally, these systems are deployed here. And we say, in theory in the West, that it's for lawful purposes. But I know that in my country, the NSA and NARIS and AT&T collaborated in order to spy on all of the American people. So this is not something that's about us versus them. This is about everyone on the planet. And it is about us exporting these technologies, and in addition, building these technologies where otherwise they would not actually exist. It was the case in Syria, for example, that before Blue Code deployed updates, they did not have the ability to detect and to block Tor easily. And afterwards, after the engineer in California figured out how to identify the Tor protocol, they were able to, for a time, in certain parts of Syria, to block Tor. This is a force magnifier. In a country where, at least in the United States, that is an embargoed country, where these types of things should not ever arrive. And they know full well that these things are happening, and they do it because profit is more important to them than people and people's lives. And this is something that I firmly, and I believe everyone else here firmly believes, we need to stand against. It took many years for the truth to come out about IBM and the Holocaust and the amount of blood that they had on their hands. We don't have to wait anymore to find that out, and the evidence is here. And we can go after these companies by simply telling the truth about the things that they do and about the harm that they have caused. Uh, Jacob, can I ask you to perhaps you could define a bit and tell people deeply about Tor is? Because sure. many people wouldn't be familiar with that. Sure. I'm here on holiday, though, so I say this just from personal use. Tor is an anonymity network that is used 
so that one may choose to reject lawful intercept while the rest of the world goes mad, if you will. It's a system that allows you to, without any logins or passwords, and without paying at all, freely browse the internet, use different chat services in such a way that if your home internet connection were monitored, for example, with lawful intercept, or even in some cases where someone has broken into computer systems in your ISP, it allows you to anonymously use the internet in a way that those systems cannot easily monitor you anymore. So that when you visit websites or review services online, you have geographic anonymity. That is to say that they don't know where you are in the world, and the people watching you don't know who you're talking to, what you're saying, or where it is that you're going. And this is free for everyone to use. It's free software, because freedom requires free software. Thanks very much. Um, Eric King uh, from Privacy International. Uh, you're going to talk on the uh, question of the using this spy technology and what its implications are for privacy in general. Um, my name is Eric King. Uh, I work at Privacy International. Um, and I run a project called Big Brother Incorporated. Um, the, the last year has been tracking the sale of domain technology with a specific focus on the sale of um, Western.
problem is that surveillance equipment wasn't included in this review. Now, why, we do not know. But what we have seen is that British companies, including Creativity Software, a British company that sold location monitoring equipment to Iran, sold its technology not just in 2009, but again earlier this year. Governments need to own up. They need to explain what dealings they've had with these companies, and they need to take steps immediately to make sure that these companies no longer continue to sell this equipment. Thank you very much. Uh, we have, uh, two more speakers. <coughs> the next is Stephanie Morrissey from the first. So, good morning, everybody. Hope oh, you're okay. I work, I'm an Italian journalist working for the <coughs> Italian news magazine Espresso. And uh, I want to tell you how work uh, on this file. So, when I got these files from Julian, uh, from Felix, uh, I was very curious about these files because, you know, of course, we, we know that we are in the intersection. We know that the more we use electronic, the more we use electronic communication, the more we are in the interception. But it is one thing to know, it is another thing to go through these documents and see what the companies can really do, what they are capable of. So it was shocking to see what they can actually do. And that is uh, the most important aspect of this project. I'm sure that many people, many journalists will say, well, we know these things, we know that we are in the intersection. Yes, we know, but look at this side. Look at what they can do, what they can, can actually do, especially because this industry is totally outside of public scrutiny. So no one knows what they are doing, what kind of relationship they have with the government, what they sell. There is no international agreement on, this, uh, on the selling and on the export of these technologies. We discovered that, for example, in the case of Italy, there is not even a software expert on the licensing authorities in charge of <coughs> uh, in, in charge of authorizing the selling of these technologies. So how can they evaluate whether these technologies are okay or not? There's no there's no possibility. So we work both on the international angle and on the Italian one because in Italy the situation is a is a special situation, then I'll, I'll let you know what I mean. So the international angle was important because we were able to give our readers uh, a picture, a full picture of this industry. We went to file uh, some files of the Spanish company, Agnisho. Agnisho actually is a Latin word which means recognition. <coughs> So if you check the files of this company, you can see they tend to represent mobile phone like a packet. They can fully manipulate your mobile phone. They can send fake messages. They can send, <coughs> they can send, uh, can, they can change the text of all your messages. And they can uh, add calls from fake numbers or real numbers. They can fully manipulate you can see the picture, that you put in your mobile phone. It, uh, you can see these pictures on the file, on the file which is, uh, is releasing today. Uh, it is also very disquieting, the German company, Elman. We work on this company. If you check the database of WikiLeaks, so you can find the Elman catalog. It is a very important document. This is a, it is a confidential document. Uh, and WikiLeaks revealed these documents for the first time. You can find only on the WikiLeaks website this document. Why it is important? It's important because uh, Elevan is a sort of uh, one-stop shop for surveillance. Uh, if you go to this catalog, you can see whatever they can do. And they have also the technologies for data retention, and they explain how government can use. They can use even to <coughs> Uh, identify political opponents. So the, it is a very important document, this one. Uh, at the same time, uh, you can see in this catalog all the sorts of technologies for all the sorts of technologies for surveillance, even the techniques 
to do undercover drilling for putting his hidden microphone. Hidden microphone. <laughs> hidden microphone. Uh, <clears throat> on the walls. Uh, then we work on the. Yes, I have problems with my microphone better now. So we work on the Italian angle. We work on the, on the Italian angle because I, I think uh, <laughs> we are in a very difficult situation in Italy. Italy is a sort of wild west for interception. Why West? What I mean with this uh, statement is a, a sort of wild West because uh, we are half country in the hands of NASA. It is not a, an exaggeration, it's true, unfortunately. We have colleagues who lead under protection. We at L'Espresso have a colleague who is a young journalist, he's only 38, but he's prominent. He's often quoted in the weekly scales as uh, one of the ma major expor experts on uh, mafia. So he is still alive only thanks to local interception because the police was able to learn in advance that there was a bomb under his car. They were ready for killing him. So he's grateful to local interception. <laughs> On the one hand, so on the one hand, we find this in this situation. We need the local interception, we check and balance. In Italy, you cannot have a local interception if you have a magistrate asking for interception and another judge, an independent judge, say yes or no to the magistrate. But, but if, uh, and we have to be grateful for, it, for discovering all the scandals all the political scandals, from the sex scandals of Berlusconi to the scandals of the Vatican, thanks to local interception. At the same time, we have some of the worst scandal, Western scandals on interception. We have the, our most important telecom uh, targeting journalists, for example. We have uh, a mafia gang, mafia and fascist gang, gang penetrating the, the, one of the most important cyber security companies. And uh, it is ironic that they were discovered thanks to local interception. <laughs> they were caught <laughs> thanks to local interception. So, uh, at the same time, we found ourselves in a difficult situation because uh, we have these standards, but we have mafia. So how can we deal with this situation? With, with this difficult situation, it's very difficult. Going through these files, we discovered that the same companies, the very same companies managing the, the local interception business are managing the intelligence interception business, where you have no check and balances, you have no public scrutiny, you have nothing. So it was very uh, important to have the evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. And our last speaker, and not by no means the least, is uh, Stephen Murdoch who comes from Cambridge University and is an expert on privacy and anonymous communication. Yes. So my areas of research are on the technology to hiding privacy, both how technology can be abused to violate people's privacy and how technology can be used to preserve people's privacy. How surveillance is frequently presented to the public is targeted monitoring of individuals where there's strong suspicion of wrongdoing and some sort of judicial oversight to prevent abuses. But what these files show is that surveillance is increasingly wholesale monitoring of entire populations, but there's no suspicion of wrongdoing. Everyone's communications are being harvested and stored in the hope that they might sometimes, some other time, be useful. The potential for abuse of these technologies and this data is huge. What we've seen in Libya is only the tip of the iceberg. Without controls on this industry, the threat that surveillance poses to freedom of expression, civil society, democracy, and human rights in general is only going to increase.
think we're now in a position where we can take some questions. And I've actually asked people to make questions and not make too many statements. Straight ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Of course, just for Mr. Assange, please. Thank you. 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 Thank
without naming names of the specifics because I'm sure that I would get them wrong, I can say that in Syria, in Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt, there are individual cases where this has happened. In the case of Tunisia, it is, it is without question that people, almost all people in that country, were monitored by smart filter devices and that there were political opponents, as they were called then, before the revolution succeeded. And those people were hunted down as a result, in addition to their things being blocked when they tried to access them. In the case of Syria, I recently returned actually from Tunisia, where I was at the Arab bloggers meeting earlier this year. And I met people there who told me that things as simple as posting on Facebook would actually result in death squads coming to people's houses. And people were very afraid to talk about specific names, but with hundreds of people being killed each day. And with those things being attributed directly to the surveillance state, I feel like it is absolutely safe to say this. And also in Syria, there is the case of some journalists who have made very grave mistakes. And in fact, if you are a journalist, you're probably making that mistake now. And this may be an error to say this, but the communication security of journalists is very serious. Because when they do investigations in a country such as Syria, when their Facebook account, for example, is compromised, which did recently happen, I believe, to a very prominent journalist in Syria, their contacts and who they worked with became compromised. And that resulted in people having to leave Syria as well. And as I said, I feel that these things are quite serious. And taking that communication security seriously as a journalist is something that will help to quell those problems. Sure. I mean, surveillance takes many forms. And a lot of these agencies, like the intelligence agency in Syria, have been doing this for a long time. This is one of their tools. Tonight, if you watch Newsnight, we'll give examples, in fact, of people in Syria that have been trapped. There's no definitive way to say they've only been trapped by a particular software, by a particular company. But it's generally a suite of tools that are offered. There have been examples, actually, a number of news outlets. Bloomberg has actually done a whole series. The Wall Street Journal has also done pieces on specific individuals who have been shown their emails that could have only been traced using this kind of software. Remember, this is a way to track any individual and actually to go back into the past also. So if, for example, there's a company in South Africa called Vastek, what they do is offer the ability to store the entire data traffic, phone calls of a country. So two years from now, the information that's held in their repository can be used to trace somebody back in the past. But again, it is one tool. And it's hard to say that one company has been responsible for a specific death. It is a whole system that security forces use. Can you identify yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Jeremy Kirk. I'm a reporter for the Biden News Service. I have a question for Julie and Rachel. You described it as just the idea of a going platform. You haven't taken permission for a long time to describe the web. Can you sort of describe how that's, what form that's going to take? So we are working on a next generation system. I've been doing it for some time. And it is threats like this that have to be dealt with to deal with national security sources. You know, here we have spoken about mass telephone surveillance, mass email surveillance, mass chat surveillance. Companies like Vastek boast in their confidential literature to intelligence agencies of storing the entire telecommunications output of the entire country and keeping it. So you can go back in history at any time you want to discover someone. So this isn't a case like it used to be of individuals being the subject of intelligence activity. This is the case of entire populations being the subject of intelligence activity. And that includes any journalistic sources. Another issue that has occurred recently, which Jacob and Eric know something about, is the problems with the SSL system. Right now, no banking transaction on the internet is going to be considered secure. That is simply a fact because of the compromise of SSL certificate authorities by intelligence agencies and crime groups. 
through for anyone who's trying to run some kind of secure service. So I mean, we have to re-engineer the basic security infrastructure of the internet. Okay, we're in the back there. Sorry, I, I, was, I was not paying attention, but uh, the question is about whether or not this puts British troops at risk. Well, it actually puts any troops at risk. I've traveled a lot in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, 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 and soldiers just like myself or anybody else use cell phones there. You can buy a local SIM card. I, I was in, actually in, in Baghdad airport, you can buy a SIM card and put it in your phone and use it. So any American soldier or British soldier, that you, unless, unless they, even if they turn off their phone, they can be tracked by somebody using this technology. They use Skype. I mean, every soldier, if you go to, uh, to a, uh, a base anywhere in Iraq or Afghanistan, <coughs> you will see soldiers using Skype to talk their loved ones back home. And that can be intercepted uh, using sophisticated technology, or actually not that sophisticated technology. Eric and, and, and uh, Jake probably better place to explain how MC catches work. But literally, you can take a 10-pound uh, phone 
and transform it into a tracking device where you can follow people. So unless they ban uh, these soldiers from using phones and Skype, uh, they will be at risk. Everybody is, is potentially at risk from this technology. But maybe Jake or, or Eric can explain more about how the technology works. I mean, you can pretty much ask yourself a question, which is, am I carrying a mobile phone? And if you are answering that with a yes, you can actually just replace that question with, am I carrying a tracking device that also happens to make phone calls? And the answer to that is actually also yes, it turns out. Because that's what GSM is. GSM, the cell phone technology with SIM cards that is used all around the world, it is a tracking network that also happens to make phone calls. And as it happens, while there may be some kinds of very bad security, it, it is the case that the telephone systems themselves are designed architecturally to support the politics of surveillance. It is possible to have end-to-end -end encrypted calls such as the crypto phone, and in, in, in this possibility, we see that it isn't the case that this happens by default, which means that we have, as our architecture, one where it is not end-to-end -end encrypted, where it is simply possible to record everything that everyone is doing, not just location data, but voice data, SMS data, right, MMS data, when you get a picture. When anything comes to your telephone, the telephone companies, the towers in between, and towers run by people that are neither the telephone company uh, nor anybody that should be intercepting your communication, those will also fall prey to spying by design. I've also spoken to a number of British firms, so I've been incredibly surprised by the number of British papers that use Gmail um, for this, their sole uh, email provider. In fact, I don't believe there's a British paper that does it. Um, the two sort of attack vectors on that are both legally and technically. Uh, the documents that we need to publish in today uh, show that in every single interception uh, tool that is being deployed now can break Gmail uh, HTTPS. And they do that in a, a number of ways. And if you look through the documents, it will explain in many cases there are slides or presentations saying proof and default breaking Gmail, proof and default breaking the archive. And the other one was all of this data is held in the state um, with Google. And uh, Google have to abide by the rules in which they reside. And if um, the NSA or anybody else uh, legally demands that they hand over the data, uh, Google can fight. But faced with an insurmountable challenge, they will legally have to hand over your data. And so I ask journalists that are using Gmail to think very carefully in the future about whether or not they're comfortable protecting their sources. This is for Julian. I work for Times Now, the Indian News Channel. Uh, we saw that you're coordinating with the Hindu newspaper in India. Uh, firstly, uh, what is WikiLeaks' input towards helping Hindus' investigation? And secondly, um, what can you tell us something about the investigation at all? I don't think I could remove the Hindus' food tomorrow. <laughs> I know. Uh, but the Hindu was a partner, like uh, all these other partners were. We pulled resources, uh, pulled our findings from our investigation. We kicked it off with a, a large case of uh, files and, and videos from the uh, intelligence contractors uh, that we all pulled together and, and today's the result. But you also see just now the Washington Post and other things come out from the US angle uh, and the news work will come out sometimes from Back there? Yeah, James Edward from the Press Association. Um, is there any concern that in revealing um, the details and the contact details of people who are under surveillance, that you're actually going to be putting them under more, in more danger by revealing their, their identity? So I take it you're referring to this list that we saw from Amazon. Yeah, for example, those email addresses could be sensitive information to those that you This list is, I think, the only. Uh, list of people that have been spied that are released today. Uh, all of those people have been contacted. They know. They knew. But they know what happened. And uh, it lasts for. Uh, it was two years ago. So it's not a privacy risk to say that the actual uh, Indian ambassador in London has been spied by a uh, French company. It, it's a fact. Uh, and I won't uh, share that because. It, it would be a privacy violation. It, it's information. It's not even privacy. I think we can we can all agree that the privacy violation has occurred already. And it's the con it's not the content of their emails. It's only that we show.
we built a, a website whose name is myfiles.org without me that shows all the countries that sell this kind of surveillance technologies and the kind of surveillance technologies they sell. At the moment, we know that Amazis uh, Area, which is a net and company who sold monitoring systems to Syria, we know that Cosmos, another French company, is actually operating in Syria. We know uh, some companies that Elaman tried to sell some uh, stuff to Egypt. The, 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 the spring, the Arab Spring, uh, is a great thing to expose those uh, dealers of uh, surveillance weapons because we begin to have proof that some Western company sold those systems to those, uh, those countries. So I think it's only the beginning of a long saga where uh, in month we'll have more stories, more companies that will be exposed as uh, doing bad stuff. It's only a beginning. We have, I think, proof for 10 companies at the moment. Yes. And, uh, I'm sorry, if I can add a very quick. So the problem is that we don't have data because this industry is totally outside the part of scrutiny. This is the problem. This is the problem. Uh, even with companies which say, well, we have moral, high moral standards, there's no way to check because we have to rely on what they say and there's no control, no public control whatsoever. So how can you be sure that it's true? Yeah, well, my point if I if I may answer. Are you accusing these companies of acting unlawfully or not? Because yourself you say some uh, uh, your colleagues have said it's not because of lawful uh, use of these technologies. So what are you exactly accusing? Yes, the problem is that uh, even with, with local interception, for example in Italy, which we need local interception, as I mentioned, there are uh, huge problems because, for example, there is no law at all for data about local interception. So we have the black market in Italy, and a big scandal about the black market of local interception sold outside. We are even caught and selling Trojans to private individuals Thanks to this project, we discovered that an individual, a powerful one, in close contact with the early echelon of the Vatican and the oil industry, bought this project. And we discovered, we were able to go through the forensic analysis and discovered that the project was not created by a rogue expert. It was sold by a company. So this company does sell only to government and to uh, law enforcement agencies. It's sold even to private individuals. So you can buy only for 200,000, maybe 300,000 uh, euros these uh, this, uh, technologies and spy on powerful individuals, on whoever. That is a wild west. And I think this project is important for this reason, put under the light these companies, this industry. And make an argument that we need the rules, we need agreement, we need public scrutiny. So, uh, hold on a second. We, we have an interesting slide here, which may be very helpful. Can we get it up? The problem is that those companies have the right to sell those systems to bad guys. That's all the problem. We need to change the laws. So, so, some of the data has, some of the proof about selling uh, to dictatorships has come about as a result of the Arab Spring. Uh, and that's really quite extraordinary, for example, when in Abdawa, the Egyptian secret police was looted by uh, protesters. Information about German companies came out, and similarly in Libya. And that's where we have the concrete detail, uh, other than this uh, good work by Olney in revealing the, the, uh, the email intercepts um, that are in the Amesis uh, manual. So we shouldn't go well, look, this is just about Libya, or this is just, just about uh, Egypt. No, in all probability, this is about every country in the world. It's just that there haven't been too many spy agencies that have had their internal archives pumped out by the population previously. Uh, this, this graph here is the big game. I call this the new great game, as opposed to the uh, imperial games that we now stand as so here we have a map of worldwide cables. 95% of telecommunication traffic is covered, is carried on undersea cables. These landing points are interception points, although they can be also intercepted on the, on the sea floor. They're in the WikiLeaks release, there are documents that describe Devices that are sold, uh, and Eric perhaps can speak about this, devices that are sold specifically to intercept cable landing points. And that means interception on maps. If we look at the, the geo 
reality. And zoom out a bit. If you look at the, the geopolitical reality, is that nearly all telecommunications traffic coming from Latin America passes through the United States, where it can and is intercepted. Similarly, telecommunications traffic from the United States and from Latin America, if it is speaking to the rest of the world, passes predominantly through the United Kingdom. Telecommunications traffic from Asia from Asia and Australia passes across the Pacific Ocean to the United States in order to get to Latin America or to Europe or to Central Asia. In the Middle East and Africa, there are very few telecommunications pipelines to connect that part of the world to the rest of the world. They can be intercepted in Ethiopia and in India. So that is the informational geopolitical reality of the world.
level of uh, technical documentation. If you're selling it to low level law enforcement, you're going to be wanting to put on splash graphics uh, going step by step in detail what you're doing. Uh, and many of these companies' target markets are low level law enforcement. I, I, I want to actually answer your question about uh, is there an accusation of criminal behavior? I think it's really important to understand that some of these tools, they're what we would call tactical exploitation tools. That is to say that they break into people's computers. Generally, these computers are located in houses, in workplaces, on your person. That's what a phone, a smartphone is, right? It's a computer. These devices break into it in the way that we would normally say it is illegal for other people to do this. So they sell tools that would be straight up illegal for other people to use. And they additionally, while selling these tools, often talk about how they don't have legal control. And at ISS World in Washington, D.C., which I attended this year, there were sometimes breakout sessions where people discussed how you could get around, for example, needing a warrant to collect data, because data retention was often considered, you know, it's not personal until you have their name attached to it, so we can give you ID numbers or cell towers or all those cell phones that were associated with the tower. And some of these tools, for example, for installing remote listening software on these phones, the phone company has to be complicit in. And, and so that, to me, smacks of completely breaking tons of laws as a business model when it comes to tactical exploitation. So every time you see tactical exploitation targeted surveillance, you can say to yourself, if this was someone on the street doing it, they would be arrested and spend a long time in jail. So in that regard, especially with regard to regulations missing in certain countries, you can probably say that the computer crime laws would otherwise apply to these people. And so I think, yes, is the answer to that. And from a large-scale perspective, when you wiretap people, at least in the country in which I'm from, the United States, it is certainly the case that wiretapping on a large scale without a warrant, without targeting people, is something that we have for, long, for, for a very long time considered to be illegal. It's part of the reason that uh, we reject general warrants, in fact, is, is part of the American spirit. And while we haven't always done a good job of keeping that spirit up, it is certainly the case that large-scale wiretapping is and should be considered a crime. And doing it should not be tolerated. And if you were to do it, it would not be tolerated. And there would be absolutely no mercy for you. So these tools are specifically designed to do things for a specific class of people with asymmetry. And that asymmetry is serious. So this document really is supposed to answer the question of who watches the watchers. And the answer is we do, the 99%. <laughs> 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 but I'm afraid, I'm afraid we have to give it a break. We're, we're too out of the hole now. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. C-115. Those are the two breakout rooms that we want. That'll be for the next 40 minutes or so.